Hello, everybody. So since I'm not here for Thursday, we are going to talk a little bit about the end of the Trojan War and an introduction to the Odyssey in this fun recorded PowerPoint format. And I'll post a couple of quizzes for you to take afterwards just to test your comprehension of the topic. And then on Tuesday, we will go ahead and jump right into reading the Odyssey. But first, let's spend the first part of our discussion talking about the end of the Trojan War, because as you recall, the Iliad does not end um, at the end of the war. The Iliad ends with the death of Hector. So we still have some ways to go before this conflict is resolved and we can move on to the next stage in the story. So for the first part, we will talk about what happens in the Trojan War after the Iliad. So if you remember, if we look at our kind of five stages of the story, the Iliad was concerned with the war stage, most especially the 10th year of the war. What the Odyssey is going to be concerned with is the return from the war. But before we get there, we need to figure out what happens in year 10 before we can focus on um, even more in depth the various issues that come about when the soldiers try to come home. So if we can kind of follow our pattern from last time, right, we have some major story stages that happen after Hector dies. So in, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of creating this outline for us. And of course, you'll remember that there's a lot of nuance to all of these story stages, but we're just going to power through them as kind of a um, kind of a, a baseline to get the, the very basics of this story finished so that when we do read the Odyssey and we do have some flashbacks that talk about some of these events, you'll have a general foundation of information there that you can draw on. So in, in very broad terms, after Hector is killed, the Trojans have to look for other allies outside of the city of Troy to help them fight against Achilles and the Greeks. So that's stage one. Um, after that, there are a series of deaths that are very serious and have long lasting impacts for the Greeks. And that is the death of Achilles and then the death of the warrior Ajax. At that point, we have new conditions for victory that are given to the Greeks by the gods. So the Greeks are now kind of on this quest to figure out what they need to do to, to win this war. Um, and when that fails, they are forced to result, resort to trickery and deceit. And that's where we get our story of the Trojan horse. And then finally, the actual fall of the city of Troy and the end of the war. So let's talk about our new allies. Um, two, two very famous uh, characters in mythology actually show up in Troy uh, to fight with the Trojans against the Greeks and specifically against Achilles. The first is a famous warrior queen named Penthesilea. And Penthesilea is the queen of the Amazons, whom you might have already heard of, uh, a tribe of warrior women who live on the shores of the Black Sea uh, in modern day Turkey. And Penthesilea um, is beautiful, uh, but she's a fierce warrior, and she's convinced that she can go up against Achilles and win. But of course, when they do fight one-on-one, -on -one, Achilles winds up killing her. And in the bottom right corner there, you can see a very famous vase painting of Achilles and Penthesilea fighting. Um, you know that Penthesilea is a woman because she's painted white in this painting. This wasn't really a reflection of of race or skin color, but a differentiation between Achilles, whose body is completely black, and Penthesilea, whose body is white. After Penthesilea and the Amazons are killed, a new hero um, appears whose name is Memnon. And Memnon is very much like Achilles in that his mother is a goddess. She's the goddess of dawn. Um, and Memnon and his people are the Ethiopians. And I misspelled that on the slide, but it is Ethiopians as we, as we spell it today. And they're from far, far away. I mean, today we imagine the Ethiopians as being from Africa. Um, in antiquity, they just understood them to be on the edges of the earth. 
Uh, and Memnon appears and again, in the same sort of pattern, fights against Achilles. Because he's the daughter or the son of a goddess like Achilles, they're very evenly matched. And it's only when the gods finally decide whose fate it is to die that Memnon eventually falls to Achilles. And so the death of Memnon and the loss of the Ethiopians leaves the Greeks um, in a much more powerful position and the Trojans in a very precarious position. Um, so it's now up to the gods to decide how they are going to see the end of the war through. So we move on to these important deaths, um, the deaths of Achilles and the deaths of Ajax. Achilles is eventually killed by an arrow shot by Paris or Alexander that's guided by the god Apollo. And when Achilles is killed, uh, this, remember, brings to pass this fate that he understood uh, was what we'd, he would have to decide, right? Is he going to stay in Troy, die young, um, but die famous, or was he going to go home, uh, live a very quiet but a very long life? And remember, he chooses to stay in Troy to fight for Patroclus's um, death and to become famous and to live forever. So, uh, so this is what happens, and he is eventually killed. Now, remember in Book 19, uh, his mother Thetis asks the goddess Hephaestus to create this really beautiful set of armor for Achilles. That's so this is divine armor. Um, and many of the warriors want this armor. So when Achilles is killed on the field, there's a, a great battle for his body. And the Greek warrior Ajax eventually saves Achilles and his body and brings it back to the Greek camp. And because this armor is so beautiful uh, and such a prize, there's actually a competition in the Greek camp for who should get this armor. And there really are only two competitors. The first is Ajax, who claims that because he's now the most powerful warrior, now that Achilles is gone, he should have the armor. And the second is Odysseus, who claims that because he is the more powerful strategist, um, he should get the armor. And uh, Odysseus is the one who actually winds up winning and who does get this armor. And this sets off a string of events that will lead to Ajax's suicide. So you can see in this face painting that Ajax is actually setting his sword in the ground so that it's sturdy enough for him to fall on it and kill himself. This is a really affecting story. Um, and one that, that has, you know, larger implications for how we understand heroes. But unfortunately, we don't have time to talk about it. So I'm going to recommend that you look up the uh, Greek tragedy called Ajax so you can learn a little bit more about him. All right, so now um, Odysseus, in possession of the armor, recognizes that the Greeks need to figure out what exactly they have to do to win this war. So he kidnaps a man named Helenus. Helenus is the brother of Hector and Paris and the son of um, Priam and Hecuba, and he is a prophet. He has the ability to speak to the gods. And Helenus reluctantly gives Odysseus uh, the list of things that he needs to do in order to take the city of Troy. So the first is that he needs to get um, the bow and arrows of Heracles, the god Heracles. He needs to find a relative of Achilles to fight in this war with him. And he must steal the Palladium, which is a, a tiny little statue of Athena from the temple of Athena in the city of Troy. So Odysseus sets off to make this happen. Now it turns out that the bow and arrows of Heracles are on an island in the middle of the ocean with a Greek warrior named Philoctetes. Philoctetes um, was injured in one of the skirmishes before the Trojan War even began. And as the Greeks were sailing uh, to Troy, um, Philoctetes's wound began to fester. And it became so smelly and so disgusting that the Greeks couldn't figure out how to fix him, but they were so overwhelmed by, with disgust that they decided to leave him on one of the islands between Greece and Troy. And Odysseus recognizes that he's going to have to go back 
and apologize and find a way to convince Philoctetes to come back to Troy so that he can use the bow and arrow of Heracles. So he gets that done. The second thing, a relative of Achilles, as you may recall, we, we do learn that Achilles has a son um, who was born before the war began. And so at this point in the story is probably a teenager. So even though we don't know much about this son, his name is Neoptolemus, um, we do know that he is a fearsome warrior, much as his father is. So Odysseus needs to go and get Neoptolemus as well as Philoctetes, which he manages to do. So Odysseus and Diomedes also sneak into the city of Troy and steal the Palladium, like the gods tell them that they need to do. But even though they've completed all of these steps, they've done everything they think they need to do, they still are not winning. So then Odysseus says, fine, I will turn to trickery and deceit to make this happen. And so this is where the story of the Trojan horse comes in. So the plan is that the Greeks are going to build this large wooden horse and leave it on the shore of Troy as an offering to the goddess Athena. Um, they're going to pretend like they've been struck by a plague, much like they did at the um, beginning of the Iliad. And they're going to say, at least in the story, that it was this plague that convinced them that they needed to finally leave Troy. And they're leaving behind this large offering to the goddess Athena um, as a way to make sure that they have a safe passage home and to apologize, essentially, for everything that they've done. What they do in actuality is build this large hollow horse and they hide Greek warriors on the inside of this horse. Everybody else gets back in their ships and they sail to a little island called Tenedos where they hide their ships and wait until the horse is taken into the city at night. They leave behind a man named Sinon who they say is a traitor and he convinces the Trojans that this is a, uh, an offering to the goddess and they need to bring it into the city. And when the Trojans do, um, not everyone is convinced that this is in fact a gift. And so Helen actually comes down to test out the horse and to make sure that nobody, no Greeks are inside. And what she does is actually pre pretends to be the wife of many of the warriors who might be inside to see if she can lure them out. And nobody comes out. So Odysseus and the men who are inside of the horse uh, resist all temptation and they wait until night when Sinon comes and opens up the horse to let them out. And that begins the final siege of the city of Troy. So what happens um, during the fall of Troy is a kind of a catalog of atrocities that the Greeks commit against the Trojan people. And this is really important because their bad behavior angers the gods who up to this point had been helping them and makes it so that they are no longer considered blessed or considered the protected folks of the, uh, of the Greek gods. So I'll just run through some of the awful things that happen. Uh, and we can kind of get a sense of what's going to happen to the rest of the, um, the Trojans, and then we'll move into the return stories. So one of the first things that happens during the siege of the city is that Cassandra, uh, one of the daughters of Hecuba and Priam, and one who has um, the ability to communicate with the gods, Cassandra goes to the temple of Athena and kneels at the base of the statue uh, in, in a pose that essentially suggests that she's taking asylum and that she's being protected by the goddess. But one of the Greek warriors follows her in and rapes her in the temple at the feet of the goddess. And Athena becomes enraged at this Greek warrior for violating her. Neoptolemus, the son of uh, Achilles, kills Priam, uh, the father of Hector and Paris and all of the Trojans, at one of the altars inside the city of Troy. And he also kills Astyanax, the Hector and Andromache's baby, to make sure that he'll never grow up to try to avenge his father. The Trojan women, um, the, the queen Hecuba, uh, Andromache, and one of the other daughter, daughters, Polyxena, are, are, 
are all divided up among the Greek men as their prizes. So we can think about Persephone.